Welcome back to Pastor Emily's Story Hour. We're reading The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This is part 29. We're still in the second epoch of the story. Chapter 7, June 19th. The events of yesterday warned me to be ready sooner or later to meet the worst. Today is not yet at an end, and the worst has come. Judging by the closest calculation of the time that Laura and I could make, we arrived at the conclusion that Anne Catherick must have appeared at the boathouse at half past two o'clock on the afternoon of yesterday. I accordingly arranged that Laura should just show herself at the luncheon table today and should then slip out at the first opportunity, leaving me behind to preserve appearances and to follow her as soon as I could safely do so. This mode of proceeding, if no obstacles occurred to thwart us, would enable her to be at the boathouse before half-past two, and, when I left the table in my turn, would take me to a safe, planta safe position in the plantation before three. The change in the weather, which last night's wind warned us to expect, came with the morning. It was raining heavily when I got up, and it continued to rain until twelve o'clock when the clouds dispersed, the blue sky appeared and the sun shone again with the bright promise of a fine afternoon. My anxiety to know how Sir Percival and the Count would occupy the early part of the day was by no means set at rest, as far as Sir Percival was concerned, by his leaving us immediately after breakfast and going out by himself in spite of the rain. He neither told us where he was going nor when we might expect him back. We saw him pass the breakfast room window hastily, with his high boots and his waterproof coat on, and that was all. The Count passed the morning quietly indoors, some part of it in the library, some part in the drawing room, playing odds and ends of music on the piano and humming to himself. Judging by appearances, the sentimental side of his character was persistently inclined to betray itself still. He was silent and sensitive and ready to sigh and languish ponderously as only fat men can sigh and languish on the slightest provocation. Luncheon time came, and Sir Percival did not return. The Count took his friend's place at the table, plaintively devoured the greater part of a fruit tart, submerged under a whole jugful of cream, and explained the full merit of the achievement to us as soon as he had done. A taste for sweets, he said in his softest tones and in his tenderest manner, is the innocent taste of women and children. I love to share it with them. It is another bond, dear ladies, between you and me. Laura left the table in ten minutes' time. I was sorely tempted to accompany her, but if we had both gone out together, we must have excited suspicion, and worse still, if we allowed Anne Catherick to see Laura accompanied by a second person who was a stranger to her, we should in all probability forfeit her confidence from that moment, never to regain it again. I waited, therefore, as patiently as I could until the servant came in to clear the table. When I quitted the room, there were no signs, in the house or out of it, of Sir Percival's return. I left the Count with a piece of sugar between his lips and the vicious cockatoo scrambling up his waistcoat to get it, while Madame Fosco, sitting opposite her husband, watched the proceedings of his bird and himself as attentively as if she had never seen anything of the sort before in her life. On my way to the plantation, I kept carefully beyond the range of view from the luncheon room window. Nobody saw me and nobody followed me. It was then a quarter to three o'clock by my watch. Once among the trees, I walked rapidly until I had advanced more than halfway through the plantation. At that point, I slackened my pace and proceeded cautiously, but I saw no one and heard no voices. By little and little, I came within view of the back of the boathouse, stopped and listened, then went on until I was close behind it and must have heard any persons who were talking inside. Still the silence was unbroken. Still, far and near, no sign of a living creature appeared anywhere. After skirting round by the back of the building, first on one side and then on the other, and making no discoveries, I ventured in front of it and fairly looked in. The place was empty. I called, Laura, at first softly, then louder and louder. No one answered, and no one appeared. For all that I could see and hear, the only human creature in the neighborhood of the lake and the plantation was myself. 
My heart began to beat violently, but I kept my resolution and searched first the boathouse and then the ground in front of it for any signs which might show me whether Laura had actually reached the place or not. No mark of her presence appeared inside the building, but I found traces of her outside it in footsteps on the sand. I detected the footsteps of two persons, large footsteps like a man's, and small footsteps which, by putting my own feet into them and testing their size in that manner, I felt certain were Laura's. The ground was confusingly marked in this way just before the boathouse. Close against one side of it, under the shelter of the projecting roof, I discovered a little hole in the sand, a hole artificially made beyond a doubt. I just noticed it, and then turned away immediately to trace the footsteps as far as I could and to follow the direction in which they might lead me. They led me, starting from the left-hand side of the boathouse, along the edge of the trees, a distance I should think of between two and three hundred yards, and then the sandy ground showed no further trace of them. Feeling that the persons whose course I was tracking must necessarily have entered the plantation at this point, I entered it too. At first I could find no path, but I discovered one afterwards, just faintly traced among the trees, and followed it. It took me for some distance in the direction of the village, until I stopped at the point where another foot track crossed it. The brambles grew thickly on either side of this second path. I stood looking down it, uncertain which way to take next, and while I looked, I saw on one thorny branch some fragments of fringe from a woman's shawl. A closer examination of the fringe satisfied me that it had been torn from a shawl of Laura's, and I instantly followed the second path. It brought me out at last to my great relief at the back of the house. I say to my great relief because I inferred that Laura must, for some unknown reason, have returned before me by this roundabout way. I went in by the courtyard and the offices. The first person whom I met in crossing the servants' hall was Mrs. Michelson, the housekeeper. Do you know, I asked, whether Lady Glyde has come in from her walk or not? My lady came in a little while ago with Sir Percival, answered the housekeeper. I am afraid, Miss Halcombe, something very distressing has happened. My heart sank within me. You don't mean an accident, I said faintly. No, no, thank God, no accident. But my lady ran upstairs to her own room in tears, and Sir Percival has ordered me to give Fanny warning to leave in an hour's time. Fanny was Laura's maid, a good, affectionate girl who had been with her for years, the only person in the house whose fidelity and devotion we could both depend upon. Where is Fanny? I inquired. In my room, Miss Halcombe. The young woman is quite overcome, and I told her to sit down and try to recover herself. I went to Mrs. Michelson's room and found Fanny in a corner, with her box by her side, crying bitterly. She could give me no explanation whatever of her sudden dismissal. Sir Percival had ordered that she should have a month's wages, in place of a month's warning, and go. No reason had been assigned, no objection had been made to her conduct. She had been forbidden to appeal to her mistress, forbidden even to see her for a moment to say goodbye. She was to go without explanations or farewells, and to go at once. After soothing the poor girl by a few friendly words, I asked where she proposed to sleep that night. She replied that she thought of going to the little inn in the village, the landlady of which was a respectable woman, known to the servants at Blackwater Park. The next morning, by leaving early, she might get back to her friends in Cumberland without stopping in London, where she was a total stranger. I felt directly that Fanny's departure offered us a safe means of communication with London and with Limeridge House, of which it might be very important to avail ourselves. Accordingly, I told her that she might expect to hear from her mistress or from me in the course of the evening, and that she might depend on our both doing all that lay in our power to help her, under the trial of leaving us for the present. Those words said, I shook hands with her and went upstairs. The door which led to Laura's room was the door of an antechamber opening onto the passage. When I tried it, it was bolted on the inside. I knocked, and the door was opened by the same heavy, overgrown housemaid whose lumpish insensibility had tried my patience so severely on the day when I found, it, when I found the wounded dog. I had since that time discovered that her name was Margaret Porcher, and that she was the most awkward, slatternly, and obstinate servant in the house. 
On opening the door, she instantly stepped out to the threshold and stood grinning at me in stolid silence. Why do you stand there? I said. Don't you see that I want to come in? Ah, but you mustn't come in, was the answer, with another and a broader grin still. How dare you talk to me in that way? Stand back instantly. She stretched out a great red hand and arm on each side of her so as to bar the doorway and slowly nodded her head at me. Master's orders, she said, and nodded again. I had need of all my self-control to warn me against contesting the matter with her and to remind me that the next words I had to say must be addressed to her master. I turned my back on her and instantly went downstairs to find him. My resolution to keep my temper under all irritations that Sir Percival could offer was, by this time, as completely forgotten, I say so to my shame, as if I had never made it. It did me good, after all I had suffered and suppressed in that house, it actually did me good to feel how angry I was. The drawing room and breakfast room were both empty. I went on to the library, and there I found Sir Percival, the Count, and Madame Fosco. They were all three standing up close together, and Sir Percival had a little slip of paper in his hand. As I opened the door, I heard the Count say to him, No, a thousand times no. I walked straight up to him, looked him full in the face. Am I to understand, Sir Percival, that your wife's room is a prison, and that your housemaid is the jailer who keeps it? I asked. Yes, that is what you are to understand, he answered. Take care that my jailer hasn't got double duty to do. Take care that your room is not a prison, too. Take you care how you treat your wife and how you threaten me, I broke out in the heat of my anger. There are laws in England to protect women from cruelty and outrage. If you hurt a hair of Laura's head, if you dare to interfere with my freedom, come what may to those laws, I will appeal. Instead of answering me, he turned round to the Count. What did I tell you? he asked. What do you say now? What I said before, replied the Count. No. Even in the vehemence of my anger, I felt his calm, cold, gray eyes on my face. They turned away from me as soon as he had spoken and looked significantly at his wife. Madame Fosco immediately moved close to my side and in that position addressed Sir Percival before either of us could speak again. Favor me with your attention for one moment, she said, in her clear, icily suppressed tones. I have to thank you, Sir Percival, for your hospitality, and to decline taking advantage of it any longer. I remain in no house in which ladies are treated as your wife and Miss Halcombe have been treated here today. Sir Percival drew back a step and stared at her in dead silence. The declaration he had just heard, a declaration which he well knew, as I well knew, Madame Fosco would not have ventured to make without her husband's permission, seemed to petrify him with surprise. The Count stood by and looked at his wife with the most enthusiastic admiration. She is sublime, he said to himself. He approached her while he spoke and drew her hand through his arm. I am at your service, Eleanor, he went on, with a quiet dignity that I had never noticed in him before and at Miss Halcombe's service, if she will honor me by accepting all the assistance I can offer her. Damn it! What do you mean? cried Sir Percival, as the Count quietly moved away with his wife to the door. At other times, I mean what I say, but at this time, I mean what my wife says, replied the impenetrable Italian. We have changed places, Percival, and for once, Madame Fosco's opinion is mine. Sir Percival crumpled up the paper in his hand and, pushing past the Count with another oath, stood between him and the door. Have it your own way, he said with baffled rage in his low, half-whispering tones. Have it your own way and see what comes of it. With those words, he left the room. Madame Fosco glanced inquiringly at her husband. He has gone very away very suddenly, she said. What does it mean? It means that you and I together have brought the worst-tempered in man in all England to his senses, answered the Count. It means, Miss Halcombe, that Lady Glyde is relieved from a gross indignity, and you from the repetition of an unpardonable insult. Suffer me to express my admiration of your conduct and your courage at a very trying moment. 
Sincere admiration, suggested Madame Fosco. Sincere admiration, echoed the Count. I had no longer the strength of my first angry resistance to outrage and injury to support me. My heartsick anxiety to see Laura, my sense of my own helpless ignorance of what had happened at the boathouse, pressed on me with an intolerable weight. I tried to keep up appearances by speaking to the Count and his wife in the tone in which they had chosen to speak to me, but the words failed on my lips. My breath came short and thick. My eyes looked longingly in silence at the door. The Count, understanding my anxiety, opened it, went out, and pulled it to after him. At the same time, Sir Percival's heavy step descended the stairs. I heard them whispering together outside while Madame Fosco was assuring me in her calmest and most conventional manner that she rejoiced for all our sakes that Sir Percival's conduct had not obliged her husband and herself to leave Blackwater Park. Before she had done speaking, the whispering ceased, the door opened, and the Count looked in. Miss Halcombe, he said, I am happy to inform you that Lady Glyde is mistress again in her own house. I thought it might be more agreeable to you to hear of this change for the better from me than from Sir Percival, and I have therefore expressly returned to mention it. Admirable delicacy, said Madame Fosco, paying back her husband's tribute of admiration with the Count's own coin and in the Count's own manner. He smiled and bowed as if he had re received a formal compliment from a polite stranger and drew back to let me pass out first. Sir Percival was standing in the hall. As I hurried to the stairs, I heard him impatiently call to the Count to come out of the library. What are you waiting there for? he said. I want to speak to you. And I want to think a little by myself, replied the other. Wait till later, Percival. Wait till later. Neither he nor his friend said any more. I gained the top of the stairs and ran along the passage. In my haste and my agitation, I left the door of the antechamber open, but I closed the door of the bedroom the moment I was inside it. Come back tomorrow for the next installment.